Well, good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord this fine morning. You all look so beautiful with your masks on. Uh, some, you know, some of you are being individualistic and being able to do something a little bit different than just those disposables, but uh, we want to make sure that we are, uh, you know, respecting each other, trying to make sure we keep each other safe and healthy, and uh, we are appreciating the fact that our government is trying to take care of us in this. Well, we're excited that our missionaries are home and now out of quarantine, and I'm going to ask Jeremy if he would like to come and give a greeting to you all this morning and open our service in a word of prayer. Well, praise the Lord, we are able to be in Canada for this season, and uh, we celebrate what God has been doing. I just want to give a brief update that uh, during this past uh, Ramadan season, we, we sent out 1,020 workers into Islamic communities, and we saw over 370,000 people come to know Jesus Christ. So... All of this was in the midst of COVID, where they were restricting gatherings to less than 30, and God is still at work. And so what I celebrate is, is what Paul says, I am confident that my God is able to do it. And in the midst of this season, we're going to see God continue to do great things. And so we have all different challenges and frustrations and disappointments and whatever's happening in this season, we still have a God who's at work. And so this morning, I encourage you to encounter that God who's at work. He wants to work in your life. He wants to work with us this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come with a thankful heart. We're thankful that you have given us sunshine and wonderful weather to celebrate and, and get outside and enjoy your creation. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ that continues to touch lives and transform us and others from darkness to light, growing us into the image of Christ. We pray that this morning as we gather that you will be exalted and those that are here in person and those that are watching would encounter our Creator through His Son, Jesus Christ. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you. Amen. It's awesome to hear what God is doing in Ethiopia and what God is doing around the world. There is victory in Jesus, isn't there? Amen. We are going to start with that song, Victory in Jesus. Let's rejoice in what God is doing. Why don't you stand with me and let's sing together.
morning. If you're living in victory, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We are rejoicing in what God is doing. Even though times are trying and it's difficult, different things that we're going through, we know that the victory comes through Jesus Christ. And uh, you can be seated at this time. Let's just enjoy being in the presence of the Lord this morning. We have just a couple announcements to make. First of all, Pastor Jeremy, our missionary, will be preaching on uh, August 16th. That's two weeks away, so you will want to uh, be part of that service. And the week prior to that, the office will be closed. There will be nobody in the office that week. All right, on August 21st and 22nd, you can see on the screen, and also August 28th and 29th. That's Friday, Saturday, two weekends in a row. We are going to be painting the exterior of the church, the wood only. It's about 2,000 square feet. And uh, some might be doing some starting this week in the evenings, if anybody would be wanting to help in that time instead. But if you could let us know if you're able to come, we're thinking of going from 9 to 4 or however long we're able to go. If you want to just sign up for a morning or the afternoon, let us know what your availability is. And also, if you are going to be able to be there for lunch, because we'll be bringing in individually packaged lunches because we can't prepare our own food. So we want to make sure we're providing food for everybody. If you have any allergies or whatever, you can let us know that as well. So let us know if you are able to be part of that. And at this time, we are going to just uh, pray a blessing over our offering this morning. As you came in, I hope you all saw that the plates are in the foyer. And online, you can give it npachurch.org and go to the donate button and it will direct you through that. And God is blessing us as a church, isn't he? We are so blessed. And as a people, uh, the blessings of the Lord that he flows upon us, whether they're financial or familial, just being able to have times together as a family. I know so many of us have been out to Canmore this, this summer. We have a beautiful country around us. And uh, it's a blessing. We have to remember to rejoice in the things that God has blessed us with. And Faith put the sign outside. If you see by the church, if you drive by the church, the back of the sign says, don't focus on how stressed you are. Focus on how blessed you are. And as the people of God, that should be something that is obvious in our lives. We're not always worrying about the stresses and the things of this world, but we're focused on how God is blessing us. So let's just pray a blessing over our offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning with hearts full of gratitude and love. God, you are such a faithful God, and so I just pray that you would uh, give each one of us that sense of gratitude, that sense of generosity, knowing that you are the one that takes care of us, that we look to you for satisfaction and fulfillment in all our needs, God. I pray that you would just continue to pour your blessing out upon each one of us and upon our church, and that, Father, you would find us faithful in everything that we set our hands to do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a few songs of worship before Pastor Jonathan comes and uh, preaches this morning. So why don't you join us if you want to stand or if you want to sit, however you're comfortable, and let's worship him this morning.
God. We give you praise this morning. We lift our voices in adoration before you, oh God. There is none like you. You are our cornerstone. You are our anchor, oh God. And we come before you and we humbly bow and we say, God, you are good. God, we worship you. We lift you up and we magnify your name in this place this morning. Thank you, Father, for all the strength that you give us. Thank you for your your power in our lives, God. Thank you, Jesus. We worship and adore your name. Thank you, Father. We 
magnify your name in this place, oh God. You are worthy. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, there's nothing like being together. And I pray for those who aren't able to be with us that you will feel God's Spirit uniting us together. Uh, you'll feel a touch from Him. And I can say that, you know, I know the power of God's Word. His Word is clear, that it his word is alive, it's a powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. By his word, he created the world. By his word, he brings salvation, he brings rescue into our lives. He releases us from, from our bondage, he releases us from stress and from disease and anything that could afflict us. That's how powerful his word is. And so as we turn now to his word, I want you to know that God is wanting to speak to each and every one of us. He wants to speak to us where we are, what you're dealing with. He wants to speak to you for what you're dealing with now, but also to prepare you for what's coming. Because that's our God, is he doesn't want us to be overtaken, overwhelmed, right? So let's set our hearts right. I know that we are, most of us are right after singing such beautiful songs together. Our hearts are prepared to, to hear his word. Well, we've been going through the, the grand story of scripture since January from Genesis through Revelation, God's grand plan. And we've seen the continuing story of how God seeks a people for himself. Uh, he desires his people to be in his presence and in his place. That's, it in some ways sums up the story. Uh, it's from beginning to end. God prepares a place for his people. He puts his spirit, breathes life into his people, and then he desires to be with us. Uh, and so were his people in his presence, in his place. And it, even though the fall with sin, the worst thing that could possibly happen God doesn't immediately bring judgment. We often think God is a God of, of wrath and judgment. While he hates sin, before he says anything regarding judgment, he speaks a word of promise, a word of hope. He comes and he says, you know, I'm going, to this, I'm going to send a seed. A seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head, the seed of the serpent. I'm going to bring about a change, a reversal to this. In other parts of scripture, he says, I'm going to kill Leviathan, that great serpent, the flying serpent. And he says, I'm going to remove that veil that covers the whole earth. All the effects of sin are going to be removed. That's what this grand story is all about. But it's, we need to remember the end of the story is also the beginning of the story as we approach that. And that's the great hope that we have, that when Jesus returns, that's the beginning of the best part of the story. And as C.S. Lewis is famous for saying, that, that part of the story hasn't yet been written. But I tell you, it's the best part altogether. It really is. It's an incredible, an incredible story, and we get to be a part of it. I want, it, we need to begin to see ourselves as in that story. We're, it's our story. This is God's story and the story of his, of his people, and he calls us to be part of it. And so we've talked and we've looked about how with the coming of Jesus, he comes in order to present that this is the fulfillment. This is the climax of, of the story. And he says, you can now enter. For the first time, you can now enter into the kingdom. And he tells us how we're supposed to, how we're supposed to enter into his, his kingdom. What an, an awesome thought that we can begin that now. We begin participating in, being with the king in his presence already. And so Jesus comes and we see that we can enter in. And he is, as John says, he's the gate. He is the way to the Father, the way, the truth, and the life. So 
on the other hand, we need to understand also that we're still in the world. Right? Well, this is, it's not an easy time. It's a difficult time. And Jesus makes that clear, John 16, 33. In the world, you will have tribulation. He says, it's, it's, and the whole time that we're here, we're alive. This is the world we know. We will have tribulation. In many ways, we could say, life is suffering. Life is trouble. But be of good cheer, he says. I have overcome the world. Because he's overcome it. If we're in him, if we believe in him, we'll also overcome it. We'll also overcome the world. And so we need to understand this distinction between the world the kingdom of this world, and the kingdom of our God, which we have become a part of, which we've become citizens of, that this is our kingdom, that this is not our home, but we have a different home. We have a father who cares for us. We have a different value system than this world. And that's what Jesus teaches about. So much of his teaching is about what it means to live in this world and how his values are different than the values of this world. So in Jesus' teaching, we see clearly that the kingdom values turn the world's values on their head. And so I have a little picture for you. I hope it shows up. Is it? There it is. Okay. So this this is our Kingdom Kids logo. If you've ever been up to our Kingdom Kids room, you'll see this logo, and you'll you'll and some of you are saying, "Hey, that's not what. What is that even? What what are you showing us here? That's the logo turned upside down." Okay. So just understand. It. I mean, but it's all there. Did you know that the the logo, the picture is full? It's just in the wrong perspective. It kind of looks like perhaps even the kids could be in danger of falling, right? It's like it doesn't look right. We, it, we have a hard time even looking at it because it's upside down. But we know what this picture is, isn't it? What difference does it make? But it's absolutely not right. And that's often very, that's very much the way this world is and the values this world ha has. The world says family is important. No, we would say, amen, the family is important. They, I, I have, how many times have I heard people say things like, Christmas is about family? And I'm like, okay, I, it is. It, it's an important part of Christmas. Of course, it's about Jesus. Let's get that first. But again, they've kind of turned the picture upside down. And they say, well, Pete, you know, the world, it's about being kind to one another. We should be, life should, is about being with people and being kind and generous and being a good citizen. It's hard to disagree with that. That's, there's some truth there. That is what life is, is at least partly about. But again, they've turned the picture upside down. It's not the most important thing. But it is, those are important things. But it is like the world lives with God's intention and purpose turned upside down. And it's why they have such a difficult time understanding or thinking about it. It's like for us, for them, we're like walking on our hands upside down. We don't make sense to them. They can't understand us. Jesus said, you know, they hated me, they'll also hate you. Why did they hate the Prince of Peace? The, the love incarnate, the word of God, the savior of the world. Well, how could anyone hate? Because they didn't understand him. Because he, he was contrary to the way that they are and the way that they think. So the kingdom values, the kingdom of God's values, turn the world's values on their head. We need to understand that this is the way the world sees the kingdom. We also need to understand this. We're in the world. You were born into the world. You're influenced by the world. If you ever go outside of your house, even if in your house, you're influenced by the world. You go outside of your house, you're influenced by the world. Everywhere we go, there's this influence bombarding us. We need to understand God's kingdom is different. The values of the kingdom of God contrast with those of this world. And there are three contrasts of the values of the kingdom 
of God with those of this world. The first contrast is that Jesus calls his disciples to lose their life rather than save it. And this is just just to focus on this for a moment. In our world today, there is much emphasis emphasis on on our rights, on preserving one's life, Uh, just in terms of also, it's not the only values that this world has. Sometimes in, in some cultures, the greatest values are honor and shame. We have a hard time kind of comprehending and understanding understanding that. Actually, you could say that at least half the world has that. So just if you think life and death is the most important thing, and you don't understand those who have this idea of honor and shame, you're not going to understand much of the world. That's the way that they live. We could, you, you know this, at least you know that there's some difference in the way that people see the world and the values that they hold. In World War II, for example, Westerners could not understand how the Japanese would give their lives, for example, in suicide missions. How would they, that was just inconceivable to the U.S. and to the Western mind that the that bombers from Japan would fly, not being able to get back, but they would give their lives for something they considered of greater worth and value than the, their individual lives. Something more valuable than their, than really, than life and death. I want you to understand, actually, in ancient minds and in the minds of the disciples, we see that they actually did not hold life and death as the most important value. For Jews, for example, they don't consider life and death as the most important value. And in the New Testament, we we see that. Jesus says, right, if you're ashamed of me before this adulterous generation, I'll be ashamed of you. Do you see that honor, dishonor? If you dishonor me... I will then dishonor you. I will reveal your dishonor to everyone. But what what do we do? How do we understand that? Well, it's not that they're totally in contradiction, but we do need to understand that there's different perspectives that people have. In our culture, our highest value is life and death, safety. And we see this in the pandemic that we're going through right now, don't we? We will sacrifice everyone, everything, everything else, so that we might save a few. In some ways, it's a beautiful thing. And when you think about it, all society will sacrifice. We will allow the economy to collapse. We will do, and, and of course, that's, we can only do that for so long, but we will, we will give everything so that we might be saved. A few of us might live, that, or might not die, in that sense. It, it comes... This was inconceivable. I, if you had asked me six months ago what the greatest value is in our Western society, I probably would have said money. I would have said greed. I never saw this happening because I thought that the stock market and people's economy and convenience and so on are the most... Now, those go pretty much together, don't they? You can see the government, for example, taking huge loans to give to people so that they don't feel... Like the, gov- like the economy has really fallen. Oh, you're, you know, you're out of a job. You're not able to work because of this. Here, let us give you money. In fact, more money than some of you would have even been making. Don't worry about coming back to work. Right? You could see, so, you know, those of us who are, who work hard, not work hard, who have h- strong, high work ethics. And that's maybe, for some of us, that's our, our value, isn't it? Strong work. We don't understand how this how this works. So we have expressions in English. It's a, it's a matter of life and death. We we get that. It's important for us to appreciate these things about our culture because the co- gospel calls us to be different. Jesus says, "Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you: food, clothing, what you will, where you will live." All these things that you, the Gentiles, the nations, the world is concerned about. Hey, I'll take care of that. But you put the kingdom first. So are we willing to give up our life for something greater? I think that actually is an important, we must actually ask ourselves that. Jesus demands that we do. You cannot be a disciple if you are not willing to lose your life for his sake. 
Let's read Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So we see here Jesus calls us to follow him. Now we know that, that to be a Christian means you're a follower of Jesus, you're a disciple, you're a learner. Um, We could make this very subjective, and I think Christians often do. People often like to make things subjective. What does, for example, I could ask each and every one of you, what does being a disciple of Jesus mean to you? What does that mean? What does it look like? I would probably get some different responses. I would get, we would get different responses if we went out, out onto the street and asked people there, what do you think being a Christian means? What does it mean to you? Well, it means being a good person, some people would say. Well, it means trying your best. It means thinking Jesus is a good teacher and trying to live like him, perhaps. We have all kinds of, all kinds of answers, but we need to understand that there is a right answer. Just because you think something is true doesn't make it so. We need to lay down our truths before Scripture and before God. Take up his truths. He calls us to do that. That's part of what repentance means. I will evaluate my life in light of his. And I'll redefine it according to him. I'll make changes that are necessary in my life according to what he says. So what does... Being a disciple of Jesus mean? Well, what is, what is it? Well, Jesus tells us it's something that's very concrete. We can all look, hopefully agree with Jesus on this. Before we just go further in this, in this text, understand at this point in Jesus' ministry, he has, just, he has made a turn to Jerusalem. He's actually at the farthest point in Galilee, afar from as far from Jerusalem as he can get, as far as he's far in the north, he now is turning and he's going to make his way to Jerusalem. Luke's gospel is actually built on this. The central section of Luke's gospel is Jesus heading toward Jerusalem. You may have read in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, for example, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. We see he's, he's, and actually in the Greek it says that idea of determined. He set his face. It's like fl- another expression that we've, you've probably heard. He set his face like flint. Okay, it can't be changed. He is going to be undeterred. He will go to Jerusalem no matter what it takes. That's Jesus. Okay, then. He, how long does it take him to get to Jerusalem? Now, it's not really that far, as far as geographically goes, especially when you start considering, you know, how big Alberta is or, or that kind of, and all of you, we all travel. But it shouldn't have really taken that long. But understand that for Luke, it takes 10 chapters. 10 out of not, 24 chapters are about Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. And it's really quite an awesome It's an awesome thing. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. When he approached approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. Between these chapters, he just is approaching there. You know the following chapter is going to have his triumphal entry into Jerusalem um, and what what takes place there. We'll talk about that next in in our next sermon in the series. But he takes 10 chapters to get there. Between these chapters... He's on his way to Jerusalem. What's so special about Jerusalem? Why does he take so long to get there? Well, Jerusalem was the place where he would give his life. He would lay it down for us. It was the final destination. And so understand when Jesus tells us that if anyone would be his disciple, if anyone would come after him, that he must deny himself, take up his cross, Luke says, take up his cross daily and follow me. 
He's saying, you must follow me. You must do what I'm doing. You set your face like flint. I'm willing to follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. I'm not going to be deterred. I'm not going to go to the right or to the left. I'm following you all the way to my death. In other words, all my days are yours. Do you realize being a Christian means you are walking in the will of God every day, every hour, every minute. It's all his. You belong to him. That's what being, committing your life to Jesus is all about. I belong to him. Now, as disciples, we miss it sometimes. A few times, a day sometimes, right? Or more. But he puts us back on track, and we keep going. What makes a disciple is that we don't stay off track. We're not those who fall away and die. We're those who, hey, we miss it. He forgives us, puts us back on track. We're in, always in the arms of our heavenly Father. And so Jesus followed the will of God, though it meant giving up his life. And he asked nothing less of you and me. He last asked nothing less that we would do the same thing. Do you understand that being a Christian is the most difficult, hard task that anybody could ever have? God could not have a more difficult mission for anybody. I'm asking you to lay your life down. I think it's kind of an adventure. I kind of like that. Do you like it? Like God is asking me to do something that is impossible in my own strength. But he gives us the power. He helps us all along the way. And that's part of what we see in these 10 chapters of Luke's gospel is Jesus is teaching them all along the way. Man, the disciples make some stupid comments. They have some bad attitudes. They make mistakes. And Jesus patiently, gently teaches them and puts them back on track. So Mark chapter 14, verse 36 Jesus was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. There's something greater than our life at stake. I mean, just imagine if Jesus lived by that model. It's a matter of life and death. I have to keep my life. I'll save my life. I've got news for you. We would all be dead. We would all be in darkness. There would be no hope in this world at all. But he saw that he was willing to lay his life down. And I tell you, the truth is, it's, it is the same for us. If we are not willing to lose our life, we will lose it, ultimately. We have to lay it down. It's the only course that actually, in, in the end, ends up where we can say, we win. Where we can say, we're saved. So the question is, after uh, at this point, is will we follow him? Will we deny our own desires when it contrasts with God's desires? Will we put him first above all else? So kingdom values turn the world's values on their head. The world has a very difficult time understanding this. But this leads us into the second way the values of this world conflicts with that of the kingdom of God. The first Contrast is that Jesus calls his disciples to lose their life rather than save it. And secondly, Jesus calls his disciples to serve rather than be served. And so let's start with reading a text here in Mark chapter 9, verses 34 to 37. But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. That's a good place, right? Jesus caught them here. Okay, um, you know, <laughs> and uh, actually that's what happens in verse 33. Jesus asked them, what were you discussing, by the way, on the road? And they were discussing which of them was the greatest. So just know that, you know, just put yourself in the story because this is our story. Does Jesus and him catch us in this attitude, in this kind, with these kinds of words? I know he does me. I'm, I could be quite competitive, uh, and I like to win. You might not know that out about me. Uh, I don't really like to lose. I play to win, right? Like, it's, uh, why play otherwise, right? Like, and that's not, I, I, honestly, that's, there's nothing, I don't see anything wrong with that. God called us to be winners. 
Not losers. He called us to be, he called us to be his kids. Right? He called us to have a purpose and to actually fulfill it. That's winning. Of course, God doesn't, he doesn't squelch their desire to be greatest, but he redefines it in different terms. There's nothing wrong with ambition. But who, whose ambition is it? Whose kingdom are you building? Are you building his? Or are you building your own? So in verse 36, or verse 35, I didn't finish verse 35. 35, sitting down, he called the 12 and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. So just in terms of moving, moving along, what is Jesus talking about here about greatness? What does he mean when he takes a child? Well, this, first of all, this example of a child would have been striking to the apostles. They would have had a difficult time with this. Children in the first century were often considered kind of like uh, pre-adults. They were not really, they, they were not thought of very significantly, best seen and not heard. They didn't have a high place in society. They're kind of like potential adults. Okay, when you grow up, then you can do something. And of course, Jesus turns this on, on its head, this kind of thinking. Um, and of course, in other stories, Jesus has to tell the disciples, let the little children come to me, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And he says, you cannot even enter into the kingdom of God unless you become like a little child. So we taught this kind of idea of, of thinking of children this way is totally wrong. It was wrong then, it's wrong now. It's wrong for Christians to think this way. But understand, there's even something greater at work here. It's not just children, it's all people that we would think of in this light, that we would think God can't do much with that kind of person. In the first century, in between Jews and Samaritans, the Jews looked down on Samaritans. And Jesus does the same thing with the Samaritans. The, the Samaritan even can become their teacher. When God gets a hold of a life, what a transformation takes place. What a change takes place. They're able to be used by him. How young of a person can God use? Any age. Even someone in the womb. I love the stories of John the Baptist, right? And Jesus. They're in the womb. Both of them are in their mother's womb. And John the Baptist gets excited when he knows he's in the presence of Jesus. Leaping in the womb. How early can we be witnesses for Jesus? Any age. God knows us. We just count people. We just count ages. God doesn't. He knows us. I'll tell you why abortion is just so wrong. God is able to have a relationship and already does have relationships with people in the womb. God knows us. At work in us. Say, oh, they're only potential human beings. That'd be like saying that about us. We're only potential. We're not what we will be. When Jesus returns and gives us new bodies, it's just totally, absolutely insanity. And Christians should, get, should repent of this kind of thinking. Children have so much to teach us. I often think how... How I learn from, from children. I mean, one of the reasons why I love being in the children's program is I would always go away learning from them as well. Their excitement, exuberance, the way they would encourage me after I did a poor job. You know, and I, I think of my son, and you know, sometimes I'm hard on him, but he always forgives me. I mean, that's a pretty good, good son. And when it comes to kingdom values, what greater lesson can we learn? Right? Children so often love animals. Gentleness. Right? You know, we say they don't take care of the animals. Well, well give them time, too. But, but they, they, re, they learn gentleness, and they show and demonstrate gentleness and love to that animal. Well, they should te they're teaching us, too. 
so much to, children have so much to, to teach us, the most important values even often. But all people are that way. God has made people to encourage and build up others. So when in verse 37, we see that um, Jesus talks here about whoever receives one of one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Now, um, what Jesus is talking about here is, uh, is the image of an emissary sent by a king. Okay, so to receive that person is to offer one service to the king himself. So a child in his name is somebody who is a follower of Jesus. And that could, again, that could go to anyone, any person. It doesn't matter whether they're young or whether they're old. If they are in Christ, we have an obligation to receive them, even as God's representative, as God's emissary to us. And so Jesus says, if you receive them, you receive me. And in that sense, there's a blessing that comes along with it. So those who, who serve the weakest and the least significant of Jesus' followers, that would be in our eyes. I, I can only imagine what God thinks when he doesn't have any favorites. Right? But when we serve people that the world considers the most insignificant, it's actually Jesus who we are serving. And it's God the Father that we're actually serving. How, how awesome is that? So therefore, Jesus' point is that greatness means welcoming those of his who are deemed un irrelevant here, unworthy of such recognition. In an earthly kingdom also, the greatest is usually the one who lords it over others. That person has great authority. We see this um, in ancient kingdoms. We see this today in we expect those in authority to have pomp and circumstance to some degree, to be dressed well, to speak well. Now, you know, there may be some figures that are kind of doing away with that kind of thinking in terms of the way they speak or, or that kind of idea. It's not, that's not uh, appropriate. But understand that that's a worldly value also of who is great who is in, in what it means to be a leader. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45, Jesus calling the disciples to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. And then this is what he says, it is not this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Now Jesus, okay, he's our master. He's our Lord. He's God incarnate, God in the flesh. Gave his life for us. But understand, it's exemplary also for us. That if we really choose to follow him, we not only give our lives to him, but we also act like he does. The values that he has toward other people and serving others is to be our value system. We're to serve other people. And we're not to get our wisdom. We're not to get the way we act toward others from the world system. In terms of authoritarianism or in terms of all, I have authority, I'll tell you what to do. But rather by serving one another. So in the kingdom of God, the kingdom that really matters, the greatest are those who serve. Now again, this, up, this turns the world's values upside down. It often turns our values upside down. Just imagine what, what the church would look like then if those who, are ser who serve are the greatest. So then we have a banquet sometime. We've had banquets, and I, just, I often think how many times the ladies of the church have taken time to and energy to serve us, to, they don't, they don't get to sit down and eat so often, right? And they serve us. What does Jesus say? Who are the great ones? The ones who are sitting enjoying the banquet or the ones who are 
servant. It's the ones who are serving. Serving is an attitude of doing someone, uh, doing something on another's behalf. It's very, it's very about we do it because we're even doing it on Christ's behalf. We serve others. Jesus also talks about being slave of all. Slave refers to complete submission and dedication to the master's will. It's not about what you want, it's about what he wants. So I began talking about in our society that we value rights. But guess what? A slave doesn't have rights for himself. First serving the master, first doing his will, and then after you've done his will, then you can eat, then you can look after yourself. So the priorities of the kingdom, again, the world says, look after yourself, do what you need to for yourself first. God says, no, you look after God's purposes first. You put him first. Just one of the easiest ways for me to visualize and think of this is, is as a principle of tithing. I have, I get a certain paycheck every month. Okay, what do I do with that? Right, well, I could, I have to pay my bills, I have to pay my rent, I have to, God has said he desires 10%. He desires first things. And that's, there's a, a feast called the Feast of First Fruits, right? He gets the first things. Do I give to the government first? I'll pay my taxes and then I'll give. That doesn't even make any sense. Do you understand how paying off of the net doesn't make any sense? You pay off the gross. You give to God from the gross of your paycheck because he gets the first. Or otherwise, you're putting the government first. Maybe you say, well, I have to pay my rent. I have to have somewhere to live. Again, you're looking after yourself first. And just so you know, God is able to take care of you. I have never found God's people going destitute. I have never found God not being faithful to his people. He is never late. He is always on time. He always makes a way. Now, that might mean going without some things. Uh Uh-oh, I have to cut my cable this month. Uh Uh-oh, I don't have money for that this month. Things that we think, oh, I have to have that. I can't go out to eat this month, perhaps. Now, that's not hasn't been a problem for most of us in the last few months, but. Or cable, on the other hand. That's another matter. Okay. (laughs) But Jesus himself had this attitude. If we look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 8, Paul says to them, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. How, How awesome is that? Have this attitude, the same one that Jesus had. Have his attitude. That's what you're supposed to have. And just verses 6 and 7 are great, but let's look at verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the attitude we're supposed to have. This is the humility that we're supposed to walk in. And it's not, Jesus has said this. You must pick up your cross. You must follow him. Being a disciple of Jesus means we're to follow him in what, what he says, what he does, and even his own attitude. So I just ask, what's your attitude like? Is it Christ-like? I think it's worth actually thinking about. God wants us to have his attitude. And I tell you, Jesus was a joyful person. Jesus, was, didn't, Jesus always lived with hope. He wants us to also have that as well. So the first contrast that we see is that Jesus calls his disciples to lose their life rather than save it, so different than the world. Secondly, Jesus calls his disciples to serve rather than be served. And thirdly, Jesus calls his disciples to live with inner transformation rather than outward appearance. Kingdom and and those in authority, even those with power, are often concerned with displays of power, of wealth, with big palaces, expensive paintings, luxury cars. It It shows people that you're important. You have to dress even a certain way. Well, Jesus stresses how he values transformation. And we've seen this already. Uh, But Jesus values, of course, being born again, being born from and transformed from the inside out. Jesus stresses we need a heart transplant. An intrinsic part of the gospel is that we need to repent and turn to God. 
Uh, we recognize that we can't change what's needed. We can't change the problems, the sin in our life. We need to go to God. We're all sinners in need of his grace. We need God to do what only he can. We can't do it ourselves. And this, is, this means accepting Christ and then remaining in him. And it means seeing things from his perspective. And this is why Jesus says, let he who has ears, let him hear. He asks the disciples on different occasions, do you have eyes to see and not see? Don't you have ears to hear and you don't hear? He expects us to actually see things from, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, from a spiritual perspective, even have the mind of, of Christ. Because we have the Spirit of God, we're able to do that. We don't live by the wisdom of this world. Well, Matthew chapter 16, verses 5 to 12, um, I'm just going to read actually verse, verses 5 and 12 just to, for time's sake. But just note here, it's kind of ironic here. He says, the disciples came to the, or verses five and six, sorry. So verse five and six and verse 12. So, and the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. Now, the interesting thing is this happened shortly after Jesus has fed 5,000 and Jesus has fed 4,000. Okay, so they're concerned that Jesus hasn't brought any bread. Why? Because they're hungry. They're controlled by their desires for food. How many of you are controlled by your desires for food? I have to include myself in that group often. Um, I'm off, off when my stomach starts to grumble. I start to think about food and what I need to do for that. Um, the disciples are no different here. D verse 6, Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, it seems like it's really, they should get this. What is wrong? Like, how could you not get this? As we, you know, we are, we have such holy minds. We totally know what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The disciples, on the other hand, are thinking that he's talking about bread. And it must be because we didn't bring any bread along that he's saying this. And so Jesus goes on to tell them, how come you don't understand what I'm talking about? I'm clearly not talking about bread. Bread is not something you need to be concerned about. But having food for today isn't something you need to worry about. Isn't that something you've learned? You can trust my heavenly father. I must be talking about something great or something more. You need to be careful that you don't follow in the footsteps of the Pharisees and Sadducees, that you don't take on their attitude. Instead of having your eyes on God, you have your eyes on outside, on ch check boxes. We need to have a living relationship with God. And Pastor Feller mentioned this, this Pharisaical attitude. He's talked about this. God wants, doesn't want us to live that way under legalism and bondage. We're free in Christ to follow him and love him with our whole hearts. And by doing that, we fulfill the law. They are so concerned that they do everything just, just right. And so in verse 12, then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So Jesus is telling them, look beyond simply the behaviors to your motivations, to your thoughts, and especially to your heart. Because this is where the Christian life is lived. Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, though we, don't, though we live in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds. What kind of strongholds? Thoughts. Taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. Understand that's where the war for the Christian goes, is every thought. Just imagine, as I mentioned, being a disciple of Jesus means following him every step, taking him as our model, but even those things that only God sees, such as our thoughts and our heart condition. We're responsible to him for that. Just before this, in Matthew chapter 15, 1 to 20, Jesus responds to a complaint by the Pharisees that his disciples don't eat without washing their hands. Jesus is, is very, he's actually very upset with the 
with the Pharisees and calls them blind guides. And anyone who follows them will also fall into a pit. He says, don't follow them. Looking good on the outside isn't what's most important, but having a pure heart. He makes this over, this case over and over again. You're, the one we should be most concerned about is God. What does he think of us? He knows our innermost thoughts and intentions. Matthew 15, verse 19 says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, faults, witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands, it doesn't defile the man. Understand this, this idea of this ritual that, we, that they were engaged in. It's not going to make you better. It's not what we, you need to be concerned about are those things, the way you act toward other people, the way you think about other people. Jesus already dealt Matthew chapter 5, right? That if you have anger in your heart, right, towards someone, you're in danger of judgment. The Pharisees look so good on the outside, but what's going on on the inside? Are you fooling anyone by the way that you act by the way that you look. Christianity is not about looking good on the outside, but about being transformed by the inside out. It's about having a real personal relationship with the Prince of Peace, with also called the Mighty God. It's about being right with God and being living in reliance and dependence upon him. So inward transformation rather than outward appearance. I just want to end with a verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but through, though our outer man is decaying. How many of you are sweating with that mask on and you feel like you're melting away? <sighs> though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Our inner man is being renewed day by day. And I want you to know that's what God wants for every Christian, is you to have a renewal where you enter into prayer and into scripture reading, doing devotions with your heavenly Father. Because we have a real relationship with him. He talks to us and we pour out our hearts to him. And that makes all the difference in the world. That wherever you go, you take the presence of God with you. Wherever you are, he's with you. And he desires that you would be a light, that you would be fruitful, that you would make a difference in this world, whether in your own family, in your homes, in this community. And so that's our promise, is that we're being renewed day by day. Though some days it feels like we're being crushed. Some days it feels like we're being just... we're. We can't do anymore. We're weary. But he's the one who gives us strength for another day. He's the one who gives us strength to finish the race and finish strong. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you, you call us. You love us. You've chosen us. And though this life is, is definitely, there is tribulation, there is trouble, there is difficulty. And you ask us, you ask great things of us. You ask us to give us all that we have to you. But Lord, you did it first. You gave us your life. You showed us the way. And you also poured out your spirit into our hearts that we could walk after you. And so, Lord, I thank you that, well, there's no other race worth running. There's no other purpose in life that brings meaning and value to us, brings hope to every day. You're the only one who brings renewal to us day to day. So we lay down our lives. And Lord, I pray for those who are hurting, that you would be their strength this morning. That Lord, those who are sick, that you would be their healing. Those who are in bondage to sin, that Lord, you would be their freedom. That Lord, you are more powerful than anything the devil can bring against us. And Lord, you desire to bring us into victory. You desire to bring us into freedom. You desire to bring us into healing into your salvation. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we started the service singing Victory in Jesus, and we know there is victory ahead. So we're going to end the service with victory ahead, and uh, we
we will be victorious in the kingdom. Why don't you stand with me? Verses 1 and 2. you as you go from this place and be a great influence on somebody this week. God bless.